Good morning. You made it. Manitobans, it's good. Well, today is Good Friday. Um, I often struggle with why it's Good Friday. We know that uh, um, we celebrate Jesus' death on the cross today, and uh, we know that what he went through, the suffering, the anguish, the pain. Um, he gave himself uh, to us as sinners. Um, we're selfish, we're uh, self-centered, we're, we're so many things that we shouldn't be, and yet we know that Jesus gave himself for us. Um, it's incredible. Um, but uh, before I tear up, I'm going to just uh, read the pastor's verse of encouragement here. Um, it says, uh, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. At this time, I'd like to call Henry up for some singing. Good morning. Uh, for the first number, let's turn to number 95. At the cross, number 95.
those are able, can we stand, please? Yeah, for sure. Good idea. <laughs> Number 266, nothing but the blood. If you'll please open your bulletins with me uh, to this week at CFC. Um, Easter Sunday, which is in two days, will be at 10 a.m. as well. Um, here's a correction. The sunrise service uh, for this Sunday has been canceled. Um, because of snow and the forecast with the wind and the cold wind chill, um, it was decided that we would skip it this year. So please take note of that. No, no early sunrise service at 6.20 a.m. on Sunday morning. Um, if anyone is considering serving at Bible camps this summer, please contact the mission board. Uh, prayer requests. Uh, pray for Alexander as he prepares for the Easter message. Um, also pray for uh, the Love and Respect series that uh, Corny and Adriana are planning on leading that's starting this next week on the 19th uh, for marriages, good and... Um, good and bad. Um, it's supposed to be uh, for encouragement uh, so that we can be strengthened. And uh, uh, also pray for those with ongoing health issues. Um, Evelyn Unra, Rebecca uh, Hubert, uh, Peter Drieger, and Sarah Rempel. Uh, condolences and to Elma Reimer on the passing of her brother, Willie Funk. Also to all others who have had some tragic loss in this last while. Uh, also, I want to praise God that he sent his son to redeem us from our sinful state. Um, on the back of your bulletins, upcoming CFC uh, events, um, Ladies Fellowship is having a Royal Mothers and Daughters Tea Party at 7 a.m. at April 20th. 
Uh, there's also a fellowship FOSPA that is planned for April 24th. Doors will open at 2.30 uh, with a short devotional at 3. Games to follow. Everyone is asked to bring snack for FOSPA. We are looking forward to seeing everyone there. Men's fishing retreat at uh, Wakusto Lake, June 16th to 19th. Talk to Kevin Drieger if you're interested. Uh, church camping weekend is being planned for July 22nd to 24th. Mark your calendars. Um, also, there's the conference picnic coming up uh, this summer on the 14th, so all are welcome to that as well. At this time, I'd like to call up the ushers for... Oh, I'm getting a shaking of head. Okay, so no offering today. Okay, then let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've provided for us. Uh, God, you've, uh, you've done so much for us. Uh, you came to earth here in human form and uh, you, you gave your life a ransom for us so that we could, that we could one day um, have the salvation and that we, could, uh, that we could come to you and that we could join you in heaven, Lord. Uh, we, we pray, Lord, uh, a special blessing on today's service as we remember what you did, the sacrifice that you made. Uh, we also pray, Lord, for Alexander as he, pray, as he prepares for next Sunday's uh, message or this coming Sunday. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will be with him, give him the words to speak. And we also uh, pray for Corny and Adriana as they're preparing for the Love and Respect series. Um, we know, God, that uh, Satan is constantly attacking marriages uh, more now than ever, it feels. And Father, we just pray, Lord, that uh, you will be with uh, Corny and Adriana and also with everyone who attends, Lord, that, uh, that you will speak uh, to us, that we can uh, have our marriages strengthened and that we can continue for years to come yet. And uh, we also pray for all those with uh, ongoing health issues, um, Evelyn Un Unra and Rebecca Hubert and uh, Peter Drager and Sarah Rampel, Lord, we just pray that you will be with them in a special way, lift them up, uh, bring them close to you, Lord, that they can feel your presence, Lord, that they can uh, feel your healing hand and just that you will comfort them. Uh, also pray for those who've lost loved ones as uh, we hear that so much these days that uh, people are passing away or dying in accidents, Lord. We, we pray for those that have lost loved ones, for the family members that are left behind grieving. We, uh, we ask, Lord, that you will put your loving hand around them and uh, lift them up. And Lord, we just pray that you will also be with uh, Pastor Jake this morning, um, that you will uh, lead and guide him, Lord, that he can... Um, speak your word, and Lord, just pray that you will also open our ears so that we can have the ears to listen. And uh, also, Lord, as it's uh, communion tonight, uh, today, we, we pray that you will bless that as we remember uh, what you've done for us. Uh, we just pray that you will bless the service and that everything can be to your honor and your glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm going to read out of uh, two different scriptures here, uh, starting with Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15. You're reading out of the King James. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And the second passage is from Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for the, uh, the gift of Jesus. That uh, you knew who we were and what we were going to do, and you sent him anyways. And uh, to save us, and for that we are grateful. We thank you for this Easter season. This gives us a time to remember. And we just pray a blessing upon the service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It is good to see all of you here. Braved the roads this morning. We uh, uh, there was a number of churches I think that canceled, and some had also actually canceled fairly early on. And uh, we were kind of wondering, should we be doing that? And finally, I decided I, I was going to preach a message anyway. And whoever could make it here to listen, that would be good. And those that couldn't, that would also be good. So I'd like to also say a good, uh, good morning to those that are watching online. I expect there are possibly more watching today than maybe than normal. Um, it is good to have you all with us, whether you are at home watching or whether you are in the building. Uh, thank you for coming, those of you that are here. Thank you for watching, those that are at home. It is Good Friday today. Um, somebody already referred to, uh, can we really say Good Friday is good? And I think we realize that it is good. <clears throat> because if it hadn't happened, the penalty for our sins would not have been taken away from us. Christ took that penalty for our sins upon himself. And that's what we celebrate today. Um, I want to, uh, I guess I'm going to call it maybe take you on a little bit of a walk down memory lane. Uh, that, that last week, last Sunday... We had Palm Sunday and Pastor Davey uh, preached about uh, where Jesus entered into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and he challenged us with the question, who do you say that Jesus is? All the people that when he was entering Jerusalem on the donkey, it says all the city was stirred and they said, who is this? And Pastor Davey challenged us, who is Jesus to us? And so I want, to, uh, I want to walk through that final uh, week of uh, Jesus' life on earth, and we will we'll be covering a fair bit of ground. I'm going to be starting in, in chapter 21 of Matthew, and I want to read, first of all, a few verses uh, in, throughout um, uh, chapter 21 up to chapter 26, and then I'm going to come back and uh, we'll walk through uh, what all happened during that last week of Jesus' life. So the verses I want to refer to, and, and the reason I want to read these is because we want to keep this in mind throughout the whole uh, mem remembering uh, that there was something else going on here, not just the things that Jesus was doing during that last week, but the fact that there was something else happening here. Uh, chapter 21, verse 46. It says, When they sought to seize him, 
They feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. When they sought to seize him, this was going on throughout this whole last week as well. Uh, chapter 22, verse 15. Uh, this is in Matthew. Chapter 22, verse 15. It says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And then in verse 46, also of chapter 22. It says, No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. And then we're going to jump all the way to chapter 26 and look at verses 4 and 5. Verses 4 and 5, it says, And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, Not during the festival, otherwise a riot may occur among the people. So these, these verses, I think, are key in remembering uh, these experiences that Jesus uh, had this last week, uh, that this whole time, the, the Jews were seeking to kill him and to trap him, uh, plotting to kill him, and so on. Uh, so now we'll go back to chapter 21 again. And uh, as I said, we want to remember the week between his triumphal entry on what we would call Palm Sunday today and the crucifixion itself, which happened on uh, uh, Good Friday. Uh, so, and we're going to be going through chapters 21 all the way up to chapter 27. So first of all, in chapter 21, in verses 12 and 13, uh, the way Matthew records it here, they don't all record it exactly the same. Mark records it as this having happened the next day, and I, I assume that it could very well have been the next day, the next morning, and that is actually how Mark records it. But anyway, Matthew records this as being the first thing. He entered the temple, and he saw all of these people with their tables set up to uh, sell the sacrifices or to exchange money and he he went in there and he overturned these tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling the doves and he said it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a robber's den now we need to understand a little bit here what what their tradition was uh, the Jews would come from from far away they'd come to Jerusalem and it didn't always make sense for them to bring an unblemished animal all the way from home because they traveled for for days to get there and so they had the option of coming to the temple and they would be able to buy an unblemished lamb to to use for the for the sacrifice that they needed to make and the money changers same thing they would come from other countries they'd come to Jerusalem for this festival and they needed to exchange their foreign currency for the the shekel the half shekel that they used and, and that was the only one that was considered unblemished and pure in the temple and so these people were set up with their booths to do this but they were charging outrageous prices for these animals for the for the lambs and for the doves and the money exchangers they were they were charging a huge rate of exchange when you go to the bank they charge you a couple of percent to exchange money to a foreign foreign currency and these guys were doing that too but they were charging exorbitant rates uh, out, unreal they, they had the people that were coming from far away they had no other option they had they had only this option to do and so they they weren't left with any other option but to uh, but to be allow themselves to be taken in essence uh, so Jesus overturns these tables and he says get out of here my house is called a house of prayer you have made it a robber's den the next thing we see in verse 14 it says the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them it doesn't give us much more detail than that. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Short verse, very simple, but I think if we just read that verse, we don't capture how many this must have been or how, how this actually happened. And, and I don't know how to make a picture in your minds as to what this might have looked like, but the, the, the blind and the lame, they, were, they knew they had these conditions. Somehow they knew that Jesus could heal them. Jesus could fix this. And so they were coming to him and he was healing them. And then we see in uh, uh, verses uh, 18 to 21, there's this fig tree. This is uh, now it says in the morning when he was returning, he had, they had left the city, they went to Bethany and that's where he spent the night. Uh, he was coming back to the city and he was hungry. And he saw this fig tree but this fig tree had nothing but leaves on there, no fruit. 
And so Jesus said, no longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. And the disciples saw this and they were amazed. Like, how could this happen? How could, how could this fig tree just wither almost instantly? Uh, Mark actually records it as having happened one morning and then the next day when they came by the same place that the tree and the leaves were completely uh, fallen off and, and gone the next morning. Uh, so uh, it happened uh, very, very quickly. And then the next thing we see here, uh, this is now uh, uh, still the, the, on Monday, I believe, uh, possibly into Tuesday here of that week, uh, verses uh, 23 to 27. Here's where he starts getting challenged by the priests and by the elders. Uh, they come to him and, and they're asking him, Who's, whose authority? Where, by who do you have authority to do this? What, who do you think you are that you could think you can do this? And, and Jesus ask, answers them with a question. I, he says, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will tell you by whose authority I do these things. And so he asked them, the baptism of John, from what source, from heaven or from men? And so they started discussing this amongst themselves, and they, they realized that if we answer this way, uh, that's not good. If we answer the other way, uh, that's not so good either. And so then they say, well, we don't know. And then Jesus tells them, then I will not tell you by whose authority I would do these things either. Because he, Jesus was, uh, was God's son, and he was doing this by God's authority. And this was something that they would absolutely realize uh, before too long. Um, and then we see from verses 28 to verse 44, uh, Jesus starts talking to them in parables, and he's talking to them in parables about the king. Uh, first of all, he talks about, the first one here is uh, the one where he has, uh, the man has two sons, and he says to one, uh, go in the vineyard and work. And the son says, uh, yeah, I'll do it. Or no, he answers, the first one answers, uh, no, I won't go. But afterwards, he regrets what he says, and he goes to work anyway. And he goes to the second son, and he says the same thing. And he says, okay, I'll go. But then he refuses to go. And so then he asks the people, which of these two did the will of his father? And well, they answered, it was the first one. Even though he said no, he wouldn't go. And, but the fact that he actually did go, he was doing the will of his father. And then Jesus says something to them that is very, very noteworthy here. He says, truly I say to you, that the tax collect collectors and the prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. He's talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees have come to him with these challenges and these questions, uh, trying to trap him up or trip him up. And he's talking to the Pharisees and he's telling them, those, those corrupt tax collectors that you look down upon so much and the prostitutes, they're going to get into heaven before you do. I'm thinking these Pharisees must have been a little bit taken aback at that because they were the righteous ones. They were the ones that walked up and down the streets praying and, uh, uh, and, and practicing all of the right things, all the right religion. And then the next thing, uh, he, he continues on with another story, another parable, verse 33 uh, there was a landowner, he planted a vineyard, and he made a, made a fence around it, and he dug a wine press, he set it all up, he built a tower, and set up the farm for a vineyard, and he rented it out, or he leased it out to some vine growers, and he went away on a journey. And then when it was harvest time, he sent his workers to, to, to go and collect his share of the, because it was his property. Uh, and the, the, the vine growers, or the farmers that had leased this, this farm, they took his slaves, and they beat one, they killed another, and they stoned a third. And he sent another group, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But then afterward, he sent his son to them, and, and he, he figured, okay, they're, they're going to respect my son, because I send my own son to, to collect the, the rent. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. And then Jesus is asking the Pharisees here again, so when the owner of the vineyard comes back, what will he do to these vine growers, to these farmers? Well, the Pharisees said, well, he's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he will rent out his vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds in the proper season. And then Jesus says to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected 
This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then he continues, he says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people producing the fruit of it. And then these, these chief priests and these Pharisees, they, they realize that these parables, these stories he just told, he was actually talking about them. And then again, verse 46 that I already read, when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. And then uh, um, the next thing we see is the parable of the wedding feast. Uh, the, he talk, tells this parable about the kingdom of what the kingdom of heaven will be like. Uh, he tells the story of, of this king who made a wedding feast for his own son, and he sent out all of his uh, his employees or his slaves. He sent them out into the street to invite people to the to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. It says. And again, he sent out more people saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. I have my oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered. He's got ribeye steaks and he's got brisket and he's got everything ready. And it's, it's good food. He's got it ready for all the guests to come. But it says in verse 5, they paid no attention and went their way. One to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. All of a sudden, these, these worthy invited guests refused to come. And now all of a sudden he was inviting everyone from off the streets, in the gutters, in, in the people that would be considered not so worthy anymore. And they gathered together all that they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall, wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. And then there's also the example of the one guest that was not wearing wedding clothes. The assumption here is that these guests would have all been given wedding robes to put on and this one man had not put it on. Uh, the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him out in utter, outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Um, I think this is a little bit of a, uh, a picture for us when he, in this parable that we are all invited to the wedding ceremony or the wedding, uh, in, the wedding celebration of our Lord. But if we don't come in a manner that is worthy, we don't prepare ourselves to be part of his wedding party, we will be thrown out. And then he continues. Uh, it continues on here from verse 15. Here the Pharisees come to, come to Jesus. Uh, again, I'm not sure which day this may be. This might have been the Tuesday or maybe even into the third day, uh, the Wednesday possibly. Um, the Pharisees come to him and they, they try to trap him in a question about taxes. Verses 15 to 22, we read about that. Again, I won't read all of these, but I'm going to touch on the little bits of it here and there, just kind of try and get the, the gist of the story. Uh, they, they say to him, um, is it lawful to give the tax to Caesar or isn't it? Uh, again, remembering that they were under Roman oppression. Roman were, was ruling over them and so giving their tax money to Caesar, the Roman Caesar, would have been something that would have been very hard for them to do because they felt oppressed by the Roman government. Uh, but Jesus, it says, he perceived their malice and he said, why are you testing me? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And it says that when they heard this, they were amazed. And they went away. They left him alone for, for now. Uh, and then the Sadducees came to him in verses 23 to 33. They came to him with a question about the resurrection. <clears throat> now this, again, this is all happening within this last week before, uh, before he is crucified. Um, he had come into Jerusalem triumphant uh, with, with all kinds of worship and praise going on. Now he's being tested and, and uh, uh, challenged uh, left and right. They tried to trap him in regards to the resurrection. 
the Sadducees was a group, a religious group that did not believe in the resurrection. And so uh, they challenged him with that. And again, in verse 33, it says, when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So there was crowds that were observing this, and they were noticing that this teaching is something out of the ordinary. And then the Pharisees come back again, and they question him about the law. Um, the Pharisees heard that he had, he had silenced the Sadducees, and they gathered together again, and they, the, they actually have a lawyer that asks him, what is the greatest commandment? What's, what's the most important thing that we need to be doing? And he tells them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And then in verse 41 to verse 46, uh, or verse 45, uh, we see Jesus now turning the tables and he, he's questioning the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus asked them a question, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, well, son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I put your enemies beneath my feet, beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer. And, and after that, they didn't dare ask him any more questions because he, he, uh, he was able to answer and he was able to uh, shut them down in ways that they, they realized where they were, they were wrong. Uh, and and this, is, this is all ways that Jesus was reaching out to the people uh, to try and tell them who he was. And then... Uh, uh, in uh, chapter 23, it says, Jesus spoke to the crowds and to the disciples. And now this is not, he's not speaking directly to the Pharisees. I believe at the end of uh, verse t chapter 22, uh, they kind of left him alone. And then he started to just speak to his disciples. And there was crowds again that were still gathered around also listening. But he was preaching to his disciples here. Uh, and he, he, uh, uh, he preaches... Uh, all the way, the whole chapter of 23, 36 verses uh, or more, more than that, 39 verses. Um, and then in the beginning of chapter 24, now the disciples begin to question him about his coming. Uh, it says, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. And he begins again to preach. And he preaches all the way through chapter 24 and chapter 25. And he tells them, he gives them, he gives them the answers to how this will happen. Uh, he talks about the signs of the end of time, the end of the age. Uh, it says, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. And so he, he, uh, he explains to them, and again, I'm not, I don't have time to be touching on all of this, but in verse, uh, verse 29, he, he starts giving the signs, what will be the signs of his coming. He's t t talking about that, uh, and then he, uh, uh, he continues on, with many different mil illustrations uh, from the days of Noah, uh, where the two will be in a field, one will be left and one will be uh, gone. Uh, he talks about the faithful householder and the wise slave. And here in chapter 25, we have the parable of the ten virgins. This is all part of Christ's, uh, Jesus Christ's message uh, to, his, uh, uh, to his disciples. And then he has the parable of the talents, in uh, verse 14 of chapter 25 and then in, in verse 31 here he starts talking about the judgment and how the judgment will happen um, there's huge challenges there I, I would encourage each of you to to read the whole account from chapter 21 through to chapter 27 uh, for yourselves uh, this weekend sometime it was we celebrate good friday and then easter on sunday uh, there's, there's much, much information here that is, is very good for us. 
so throughout chapters 24 and 25, he's preaching to his disciples. And then in chapter 26, verses 4 and 5, it says again, And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, Not during the festival, otherwise a plot may occur among the people. And then we see the, the story of the, uh, the, the woman that comes to him with a, uh, with a bottle of uh, perfume and pours it on his feet. And they, they kind of think that, why, why did you allow this? This was a waste. This was expensive product. Uh, why did you allow her to do this? And, and Jesus tells them, uh, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. This is something that is going to stand out throughout history, uh, what she had done. Uh, and then we see from verse 14 to verse 16, we see where Judas is the one that will betray him. He goes out and he makes a deal to betray his master. In verse 17 to 19, we see uh, uh, where the table is prepared, or the place is prepared for that Passover meal. Um, and then Jesus talks in verses 20 to 25. Uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples uh, about the betrayal. He's, he's actually telling them, one of you is going to betray me. And, uh, and they're, they're all, they're all uh, afraid and they're wondering, okay, surely not me, Lord. Uh, they all began to say to him. And then he tells them, the, the one who dips his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. He says, the son of man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And even Judas, the one who betrays him, he says to him, surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. And so he's actually speaking with the disciples and to the disciples here about his own betrayal. And he re reminds them in verse 29, uh, that this will be the last meal that they will share together. He says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So these are all, all the events that happened in that last week before uh, his crucifixion. And I, I don't know, uh, um, again, I'm not sure which exact day, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, which days these all happen or in exactly what order. But these, I just wanted to kind of walk you through this, this, these days and these, this journey here uh, up to his betrayal and his crucifixion. But I want to also ask, have us ask ourselves, how do we remember Jesus? We probably remember him from a lot of these uh, things that we just talked about. But there's probably other things we remember him by as well. We remember him being born as a baby in Bethlehem. Uh, we remember uh, different things that stand out to us about what Jesus did and what he said. But m what we need to remember, the absolutely most of all, is that we need to remember that our Jesus, Jesus Christ, he was the one, he was God's own son. And we need to remember that he died on the cross. We need to remember him on the cross. Of all the memories that, that our Lord wanted his disciples to retain, the one that he specifically requested that they remember was that of his death on the cross. And so he instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper or communion as a way that we as believers could be reminded again and again of the significance of his suffering and death and remember what the primary purpose was for him coming into this world. And that purpose was to die for the sins of a wayward, lost, and helpless human race. In uh, chapter 26, verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. And I'm not, not going to read the, the, these verses all of them, but I just want to also go through a little bit of what happened here with Peter. Uh, Peter was one that he stood up right away and he says, no way, I am not going to walk away from you. It doesn't matter what happens, I will not fall away. And Jesus predicts that he will deny him three times before the rooster crows. That's, that means before sunrise or before the next morning. And Peter again says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. 
But then later on we see that they all fled. In verse 56, it said, All of this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. I want to also read um, from in chapter 26 from verse 45 to verse 56. Uh, starting at verse 45 in chapter 26, it says, Then he came to the disciples and said to them, uh, he had gone to the Garden of Gethsemane because he was, Jesus himself was troubled. He was burdened with what was about to happen. Uh, he was fully human after all. And he knew that he was, he was the one that was going to go to the cross and be crucified. And so he was troubled. He was burdened. He, he went to pray by himself. And the disciples couldn't wait for him long enough without falling asleep. And he comes to his disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave, him a, gave, him a sign, gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately Judas went to the Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do you have, do what you have come for. They, then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? At that time Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Now this happens on the Thursday night. It's usually pictured as being late at night in the Garden of Gethsemane, dark outside, and that's where Jesus was betrayed and arrested. Uh, and then I want to jump to chapter 27, uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now when morning came, this is now Friday morning, Good Friday morning, when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Then I want to jump to verse 11. It says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. It is as you say. His question was, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' answer was, it is as you say. Then I want to jump to verse 27 in chapter 27. And then I want to read the story of the actual uh, crucifixion. I'm going to read through to verse 51 from verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put on his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. But when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. 
He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard this, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. So why did Jesus specifically want us to remember this event? Because it reveals to us the greatness of his compassion, the compassion of God the Father toward us. Jesus Christ was the sinless, stainless, spotless Son of God, and he was put to death on the cross to reveal to us the greatness of God's love for sinners. And I just want to bring us back again to verse 50. Uh, I just said that he was put to death on the cross. Verse 50 says, he yielded up his spirit. They didn't take his life. He gave his life. I think that's very no noteworthy. They didn't take his life. They didn't kill him. He gave his life. It is this memory of Christ's death on the cross that reveals to us how much each individual soul is worth in the eyes of God. We should not and we cannot reject or neglect this great truth. And so this morning we want to partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper and, and I want us to focus our minds and our emotions upon that most significant event in all of history. That is Jesus giving his life for us. As we visit Golgotha and contemplate his death and suffering, let us remind ourselves about how great his love was to us. Let us, each of us, allow this experience to stir our emotions and cause us to love him and trust him. Let us make decisions during this experience to change our ways and bring them into conformity with the will of our loving God. At this time, I will ask the song leader to come up and we'll sing one more song and then we'll go to the communion. Let's turn to uh, song number 259. Some questions that only we can answer for ourselves. Number 259. Can we stand, please? Been sitting for a while.
So in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 28, Jesus shares this special meal with his disciples, those whom he had called to be his followers. And Paul also asks the Corinthian Christians, uh, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, to participate in the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. And so all Christians should participate regularly in the Lord's Supper, but not without self-examination. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 27 and 28. So this table is prepared for those who have been born again by the Holy Spirit of God, and it follows then also baptized as a public testimony. Communion speaks of participation, community, sharing, and being of one mind. Those who are saved and in right relationship with God and man should participate. And so I want to welcome each one of you here to the Lord's table, especially if you are here perhaps participating for the first time or, or as a guest this morning. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, being here. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. As we seek your face this morning, we are reminded of the cost of our redemption the deadly consequences of our sin. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to become sin in our stead and being willing to die a sinner's death. We thank you for the new life that you give to us as the victor over death. And so we want to remember through this remembrance meal and commit ourselves anew to following you, taking up our cross and walking by faith in the newness of resurrection life. In Christ's name, amen. Matthew 26, verse 26 says, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Before we distribute the bread, we want to ask God's blessing upon it as well. Would you bow with me as we ask God's blessing? We pray, gracious Father, that you will sanctify this bread. As we partake of it, may it be in true remembrance of you. We want to remember the body, your body that was broken on our behalf. In Jesus' precious name, amen. At this time, Pastor Davey and I will distribute the bread while some music plays.
At this time, we would just like to make sure that we haven't missed anyone. If, we, if anyone has been missed, we would be more than happy to serve you. At this time, then, let us eat of the bread, remembering that it is a symbol of the bread of life that was broken for us. In Matthew 26, verse 27, it says, And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood from my covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. At this time, we would also like to give thanks for the cup. Would you bow with me again? Our gracious God and Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for our redemption through the blood of Christ. We pray that you will sanctify this cup and bless all who partake of it by faith, faith in your shed blood, your, the Son of, Son of God, Jesus Christ. May we partake in true remembrance of what you have accomplished for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. At this time, the deacons will pass out the, the juice.
Once again, we would just like to make sure we haven't missed anyone. Be more than happy to serve you. I invite you then at this time to partake of the cup of remembrance. I want to close with a few verses from Psalms. Uh, Psalm 117. Part of, part of what communion is is also the, thanks, the thankfulness part, the, the giving thanks for what Christ did for us uh, and, and praising him for that. In Psalm 117, it's only two verses. It says, Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. For his loving kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. And then also Psalm 118, the first four verses. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. O let Israel say, His loving kindness is everlasting. O let the house of Aaron say, His loving kindness is everlasting. O let those who fear the Lord say, His loving kindness is everlasting. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you again for what you have done for us by sending your son to this earth, first of all, to be born as a baby, to live his life here, to give us example as to how we are to live life, and the challenges that he gave to us through your word, that he gave initially to the disciples and to the Pharisees and to all the crowds that gathered around, those challenges apply to us today just as much. Lord, help us to realize what it is exactly that you have done for us by sending your Son. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for giving your life on the cross so that our penalty for sins is paid. Help us to always remember that. Help us to live our life as examples of, of your love and everything that you have taught us wherever we go and whatever we do, that we would be shining examples of that. Give us strength and give us wisdom as we seek to do that. And as we go from here, we pray this in your precious name. Amen.
Again, thank you all for coming this morning, and I trust that you will have received a blessing through this morning service and participating in communion together. I want to leave us with benediction from Numbers where it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace.